here with success of your restoration and reconciliation of families. You are the God of the families and we love these children and we thank you that you are bringing them back on wings of angels to their loving mommies and daddies. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank everybody who came today. Um, we certainly appreciate the support and we're here for each other. We want our children home. And you're going to hear different aspects and, and uh, different information from people that have spent a very long time investigating uh, Child Protective Services, especially in Arizona. And so our first speaker I'd like to introduce is Steve Isham. Um, he's been an advocate for a very long time. He's got a lot of experience and has developed. And I will let him have the floor. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everybody. I wrote out a pretty long speech, but everybody's kind of been more of an hour, so. Yeah, let me get him by. <laughs> so, okay. My name's Steve Isham. Uh, I've been a teacher here in Arizona, an educator. I started teaching in 1975. I've worked in every single system uh, that any child could be incorporated or involved with in the state of Arizona. Uh, so 42 years. Uh, I'm retired now. My wife was a school or a nurse for 26 years. Uh, I taught 20 years for the University of Phoenix, 17 years at Glendale Community College, 14 years at, uh, or 17 at South Mountain Community College, 14 at Glendale Community College. I've taught everything from kindergarten up through people getting a master's degree. Uh, I was a principal on three different times. I've served on all kinds of government or governor committees and that type of stuff. And I'm not saying this to brag. I just want you to know who I am and that I find it hard to see if anybody's got the same level of experience that I have in these different systems. Uh, first thing I want to talk about this morning real quick is as we're standing right here, there are 260 children missing from the Department of Child Safety. 260 kids that they have no idea where they are, what's happening to them, or anything. There's no investigation. There's no uh, list of those kids. Uh, they're not reported as, uh, there's no missing person report. None of that stuff is done with these kids. They're just gone. The statistics of where they've gone are pretty devastating. First and second thing, uh, we can call this anything you want to call it, but the bottom line is this is Child Protective Services. There's a thing in uh, business and companies and stuff called branding. We can, uh, you know, the governor and everybody knows that this system is corrupt, it's dishonest, and it's not working. It's not broken. It's just not working the way we as citizens would want it to work. So they rebranded it, calling it the Department of Child Safety. Same people, same buildings, same policies and procedures. It was just the idea that they would rebrand it to make it sound better than it was. Because if you say CPS, everybody cringes. So you'll hear me say DCS backslash CPS. Uh, Third thing, the system is broken. People say that, it drives me crazy. It is not broken. This is a finely tuned system with specific reasons of why they take children. In my 42 years, some of those reasons are child abuse and neglect. That happens. And those kids need to be saved and they need to be taken care of and extra services given to. Next, kids are taken for medical malpractice. One of the fastest ways to get rid of a medical malpractice suit by a physician or a hospital, or a physician or a hospital, is to take the child and the false pretenses, then take and uh, accuse the parent and sever the parental rights. Lawsuit goes away. Hospitals are happy, physicians are happy, insurance companies are happy. Next is custody battles husband and wife and they're getting a the divorce or whatever, the worst thing in the world that can happen is to get CPS involved. Because they're happy as anything to take those kids. Next is federal funding. You get 
about $72,000 a, a year for a base level pit. That no, no problem, supposedly, that type of thing. It goes up. The more things that they can do, get them on psychotropic meds, get them into foster care, get them into counseling, get them into special ed, uh, the more money they get from the feds. Next is medical research. Again, these are things that I have seen in my career. So they do medical research. No parent to study. I don't want my child being done that way. I don't want those tests done. I don't want the medications given. Next is genetic research. Look up TGEN. T-G-E-N. TGEN. It's a genetics uh, research company here. And guess who one of their main board members is? Your governor, Ducey. Mm -hmm. Okay, next is pharmaceutical drug trials, black label drugs. These are drugs that have not been approved by the Federal Drug Administration, FDA. Next, uh, adoption pool. There's always a need to have kids in an adoption pool. Uh, employment. This is one of the largest businesses in the state of Arizona. Over 14,000 kids in state custody right now at $72,000 a year. That's a lot of money coming down from the feds. Also employment. When you look into these cases and all of the parents here that have had their kids taken, you know you have ethics, multiple social workers, multiple counselors, judges, lawyers, psychiatrists. See, now that would be nice to have psychiatrists, but you see a psychiatrist would never sign these documents, ever. They would lose their medical license. So they use psychologists on purpose because uh, it's not the same thing. Doctors making tons of money, psychologists a heck of a lot less. No psychiatrist is going to sign the documents necessary to do what they're doing to your families. So federal grants, incentives, and pedophile rings. Uh, the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution talks yeah. about searches and seizures. They tried to get a bill through the legislature this year about yeah, uh, warrants. They're never going to use warrants to take these kids. They can't. So they use a court order. To get a warrant, the person has to swear before God that this something happened and exactly what that was. Okay? Then a judge signs off on that. No judge ever is going to sign a warrant when a CPS worker gives them the same information that they gave the judge to get a court order. So it's, it's apples and oranges. And the law enforcement is the strong arm. Law enforcement, when you talk to beat officers, they know exactly what's happening. Everybody knows other than parents that get this thrust on them. Police officers, don't talk to a beat officer off the record. He'll tell you, I don't want anything to do with this. I know it's wrong, it's inappropriate, but we have to, they told us to do it. I don't want to lose my job. Treat for these kids to get better. There's tons that are not. There's tons that are worse. One out of five youth who arrive at a shelter come directly from a foster care home. 38% nationally say they have been in foster care at some time during the previous year, this study found. Experts estimate that 45% of those leaving foster care become homeless in the first year. Another survey found that between 25 and 50% of the young men in homeless shelters were former foster kids. It's human. The <laughs> Constitution does not apply to family court. Huh? The Constitution does not apply to family court. I've been told that by every well, yeah. all their homes. The survey also found that 80% of the prisoners in the Illinois penal system were former foster kids. So I could go on and on with those statistics. <coughs> uh, in a general population of people, all of us here, that one in four of us has either a mental issue themselves or a mental health issue, or their family member does. This is what happens to foster kids. In the normal population, we have 100 kids here, four and a half of them will have PTSD. Foster kids, it's 21% have post-traumatic stress disorders. Major depressive disorders, 
10 in the general population, 15 in the foster care population. These numbers go on and on. Panic disorder, social phobias, general anxiety disorder, alcohol dependence, and so on. In a former foster, these are new dentures. I'm just having a heck of a day. New dentures and everything else. <laughs> Uh, in the former foster children population, there are 24% who experience homelessness after aging out. Uh, again, I could go on and on with these statistics, and if anybody wants a copy of this, you can just email me that. Tell me your email address, please. It's my last name, Isham, I-S-H-A-M, 623, so my last name with the area code, at AOL.com. People always say, AOL, you still use that? You got it now. I'm very traditional. I've been married to the same woman 45 years. So, yeah, they were the same. Only oh, lived in two houses. That's three questions. Yeah. It works. Why change? Yep. Okay. Let's get more specific to Arizona. All of these statistics I'm saying are probably worse in Arizona. We take more children here in Arizona, percentage-wise, than Texas, California, and New York. If you want to run for president, you have to win those three states. But we take more kids percentage-wise than that. Arizona's the number one state. Uh, usually, we're pretty much in anything, we're 45th or worse in just about any area that you want to talk about with kids. Mm -hmm. Like you're taking children. Yeah, everything number I read one. is we're number one for most children in the system. Yeah. Well, yeah, full parents in Arizona. Parents, social workers, that type of thing. This is, I don't have the entire research done, but I have some of the statistics already done, but then they need to be put into a, a paper like uh, these 31, 351 individuals, ladies, 7%, 71% of these are women, whether it's social workers, moms, whatever. So this is not focused on men. Men are pretty well left out of the equation as much as possible for whatever reason. 78.2% of the kids taken in Arizona are for neglect. Uh, that could be, yeah, it's a broad definition. 51.8% of the accusers were social workers. 50%, 51. So they, again, how did they get in that situation or that thing before the, the uh, abuse was discovered. It's kind of like, wait a minute, how did you get in, how did you get into my business before anything was ever reported? Waiting at the hospitals. Yep. Oh, Part yeah, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ten, seen, ten percent of these kids are hospitals, eight percent are from physicians, five percent teachers, and four percent uh, the spouse. Fifty-six point eight percent of the parents were threatened by CPS workers and 30% were uh, threatened by the police. Only 34% of the population were placed with a relative. Any, any normal state, they go for kinship care. Uh, not in Arizona. Uh, they won't do an entire search for the entire family and find out that there's healthy, acceptable family members that could help with these kids. If anything, they'll make up allegations against the other family members so they can't, the children can't be placed with them. Or delay their approval process yeah. and then say they've already had bonding time with their current place. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, well, you get money for adopting them in another state from family. Yeah. <laughs> While in foster care. This is, why, this is when the child is taken and they're in the foster home. 58% got worse in the foster home. 52% of the children were lied to by the foster parents. 52% wanted to adopt the child. 41% were abused in the foster home. So if you get 10 kids you put them in the foster home, four of them were abused. And they may not have even been abused in their normal family. <clears throat> the education 
while they're in care. 58% of these kids had school problems, behavior problems. 59% CPS never transferred the school records. When you take your child to another school, you bring the school records and the shot records. They want, you know, you won't take my kid unless I give you that stuff. No, schools will take CPS kids without asking a question. 64% never had their health records. So you, I had one family I advocated for. The girl had a shut, a shut in her brain, which drained fluid into the stomach. She was not to have any sports, any physical education. She was supposed to be somewhat guarded physically. None of that was shared, so she's out playing volleyball, doing all kinds of stuff. God only knows what happened with that if she would have had just a simple bump in the head. 92% of the children were lied to by their CPS caseworker. 81% of the time, the CPS worker withheld information. 57% of the time, the CPS workers threatened the parents. 58% of the time, parents were told by their attorney, this is the person that's supposed to be helping you. Just go along. <laughs> Fifty-four percent of these attorneys did not use the evidence that would have gotten your child back for you. They get paid the same either way. Guardian ad litems. Sixty-nine percent. These are supposed to be the eyes and ears of the court. Sixty-nine percent of them lied or misrepresented the child to the court. Yes. Yep. Sixty yes. percent never interviewed or met the parents. Yep. Yes. yes. So I'm going to talk about you, and I've never met you. Never even talked to you on the phone. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. 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 No, yes. no contact. But I've read a lot of CPS reports. Yeah. That were from angry family members or whatever. Yeah. Or from CPS themselves. 48% said this the guardian ad litem was hostile to them. Yep. Yeah. 30% yeah. never met the child other than in court. Don't know. They didn't go to the house, they didn't go to the school. They didn't know what that child looked like if the child had not been brought to court. And they're the eyes and ears of the court. Uh, 73% of the attorneys from the, the Attorney General's office withheld evidence in the case. Yep. 70% of the expert witnesses either lied or misrepresented the person, the parent to the court. 87% of the therapists or counselors tried to drive a wedge between the mother and the child. Just the parents and the child. And the father. And the father. Yeah, they did that too. 80% lied or the misrepresented on. the court. Oh, yeah. What father? I know there's a lot of statistics. We're extorting. Yeah, father. Fathers are extorting to see their kids. Yeah. Yep. You sign this or you don't. Get, I'll make sure you don't get to see your kids again. Yeah. <laughs> you sign this or I'll make sure your abusive husband gets this. As far as support, there wife. is like, you know, single mothers can get a lot of support just about for anything they need. But as fathers, like even just trying to get it, like the biggest thing is like legal advice in the family courts, because the family courts operate on their completely own system, separate from what the justice system really is in our, in our Constitution. They, they don't care about any like real evidence. They go off of hearsay. They manufacture hearsay. And these judges just like, they're, they're biased too. They, 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 they like their high and my, mighty position. And, and they use it against fathers. Like, and they, 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 they ignore divorce decrees. They do, they, they, like, already orders that should be enforced. They don't even enforce them. And it, it's just like a hopeless scenario. It's just, it's, it, I've, I've been going through this for two years. I was court ordered to see my son two years ago. I've been separated from, like, from, for over five. And I still haven't seen my kid. And it's like, where the hell is my kid? And, I, and they do with? nothing. They, they, they silence me in court. A gen, Judge Jennifer Ryan Tuhill silences me in court, and like I don't even have a chance to actually present what I have to say or anything. It, it's, 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 it's insane. It's, there's no due process anymore in any of the courts in Arizona, whether it's criminal, family, or civil. And your your governor knows this. It's not a secret. Oh, well he knows. Very well aware. Every single legislator 
is warned after they're elected and before they are sworn in. They're warned by the Attorney General's office, stay the hell out of this. Okay, if you get involved, my office, this is the Attorney General's office, my office will not save you or protect you or guard you in court from this parent's lawsuit. So they're scared to death to even talk to you. They send you to, there's a funnel point, and her name is Maria Hoffman, okay? Every single legislature know, legislator knows that's where you send these people to get rid of them. And Maria Hoffman, if you haven't dealt with her, be ready. She's a mouthpiece. Well, I've talked enough, I think more parents should be talking. So thank you. Thank you. And it tells what the court did not look at. They said, she's guilty of custodial interference, interfering with the state's custody. They didn't give her a chance to enter anything about why. Well, I can why, you why did you why did you interfere? Oh no, that's precluded from the trial. You can't even talk about it. She well, probably, this talks about it. She probably told her children she loved them. Visitation. Well, it was it was Takeda Williams. Her her child was being sexually abused by the CPS foster mother Margot Moore. Her two minor children, Emmanuel and Love, were sexually molested and raped by CPS workers and a taxi cab driver from VIP Taxi, owned by lawyers, while others in the care of CPS, including Love, who was being raped with a coat hanger. This was presented to that judge, and as a result, they didn't put her in jail. Who's her? <laughs> you didn't say the name. Crystal. Crystal. Yeah. Who's the judge? Who was the judge that was touching the case? Janet Boswick is the one who sentenced her. The one who prosecuted her and wouldn't allow the defense retired. It was his last That's case. That's another story. And it's a it's whole new story. Later. Oh my goodness. They change judges if one starts to agree oh, with yeah. something. Oh yeah. This is... Well, Judge They really take well. the jurisdiction. They don't have it, so they take it. If you don't object, you waive your right. She didn't show up for her trial. Had she shown up, she'd have gone to jail. That's how Adam at this guy was. Years. So my viewpoint is that that male judge at the time of the uh, trial was part of the pedophile ring. There's been at least 10 cases in federal court against Tucson for the pedophile activities down there. We need to find out each one of those case numbers so we can go to the federal court and get copies of the lawsuits that are against the state of Arizona so we can bring our own. That's one of the objectives that I want to done before another month goes by. So I'm going to be looking into that. But something has to be done. It has to be done in federal court because Arizona courts are overthrown. It's overthrown government in Arizona, period. We haven't got a chance. You Arizona. don't have a chance, period. You don't have a chance. You parents, you are going to lose your children no matter what because they took jurisdiction. They're making too much money and they're using it for pedophile rings and other reasons. It's all about that, the money. That's beyond your comprehension. You have no idea how bad this is. They try and say that there's no evidence for any of this, but there's plenty of evidence. There's plenty of evidence. There's plenty, there's plenty of evidence. evidence. And, and, and the thing is, there's so much that authorities are ignoring. Yeah, but so there's at least right ten lawyers right here in our hometown. At least ten. All the there's sick, least diabolical least things that are going on in Sunny Slope yeah. and other places that people don't even want to speak of. And people didn't show up today for only one reason: they're too busy working to pay their lawyers. Yep. And a lot of them too, or they're too scared. Pay attention are scared because they hate oh, being. Oh, what if they show up here and they get filmed and should go somewhere? They may be in even more trouble. Yep, yeah. they might go to jail for yeah. interference by the time it's all their, done. Their bar license. So, you know, even though I've taken a video of you guys, I'm not going to just release it to everybody. It's not going to go out on the internet. It, it should. should. It's just for our information. Right <clears throat> There's something that's wrong with our government, and we have to stand up and do something about it. If we don't, we've admitted no, that they're right. Let's take them up behind the barn. 
They're just out of control of statutory. By tree in front of the courthouse. They, they manufacture these laws. They, they think they're brilliant in the way they write them with legalis, and they're not. They're, they're obnoxious in the way them, and law enforcement interprets them. And it's like whenever you actually have real custodial interference going on, you can do nothing about it. But yet the state will, will use it as a way to just attack us as a people. Everything's about them. Like the same way when, when it comes to being, having a police report actually falsified against you. Yep. The state is the victim. Not the person who's actually lied, being lied about and slandered. Let me explain one of them. Down here in, in southern Arizona, there was a, an incident that happened on the freeway with the CPS or not CPS, a uh, Department of Public Safety uh, officer who was attacked by an illegal and he was being beaten to death and he called help from one of the passengers that, that was going by, a Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan went and got his gun and had to kill the, the Mexican that was attacking him. Committed murder. Killed the Mexican. Well, guess what? He was a hero because he saved the, D, the, the Department of Public Safety officer. In her case, the, it's just the opposite. Instead of a, D, uh, a Department of Public Safety officer, it was uh, just trade the places, and she's guilty. See? But that guy wasn't charged with murder. He was he was let go. When you're a parent, you know that like when you're trying to defend or protect your own child from any situation, like it's your own life above everything. It's like defending your own life. That's and right. And what they don't have at all in our constitution, which they do have, is they have a right for us to defend our lives. Like there should be no tomorrow. Oh, they, wait. They, like even in this state, I take exception. I take exception. They changed the law. Oh yeah, but this they change the law. law. They pollute everything the Constitution is supposed to give us. When, when you, it comes to what is sacred, like just uh, our children should be just as sacred as our, our right to protect our own lives. And but there's nothing protecting that anymore. No, they like, changed like, the law. There's, there's the not Constitution even, like, the assumption not that, that was there court. is gone. Arizona changed the law. The right Let me trial. finish this. Why can't we have a trial in the family court? Uh, with a jury so trial. Do, it's jury like trial. They, they push you out of that. They they they, they make so much. It's, they give you no proper representation. Most people have no representation in the first place. You show up and you think there's going to actually be a conversation or a dialogue, and there isn't. It just nope. It's, 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 yeah, and, 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 and they actually do what is completely unconstitutional, which I don't know how they allowed it to get into our laws as a court procedure. Is they will actually completely silence another party based on a, a no default stipulation. It could be somebody who's not even on that to file a, a motion properly. And, and, and it's that, that, that person really gets to say nothing in court. Yes. All right, they changed the, the law. They changed the law. Let me explain Marshall. this. Let me explain this. They changed the law. At one time, you had the right to defend yourself. They changed the law. The only one who has the right to do anything, like take the life of somebody else who is interfering with it, is a policeman. Not the public. The public is forbidden from taking action against another person. And this is why the constitutionalists are saying, though, they have no right to do that in the first place. That Congress or the state, the state laws, any of the principalities have never a right to affect what's a God-given right in the first place that was just labeled in our constitution. In the same way, our, what our love is for our children is a God-given thing. It's sacred, and they need to butt the hell out of it. Plain and simple. Then regardless of what I need to say they changed the law, but screw their law. Yeah, but it's not problem. common law, that's it's a problem. fake law. It needs to be thrown out. Nobody objected. If you don't object, you would agree to it. it Nobody you objected. They cast it half the time because they do it at 3 o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping. That's right, you still got to object. You've got to be willing to go to jail objecting to the law. And if you're not willing to go to jail to object to the law, it'll never get before the federal court. The federal court is pissed off at the state of Arizona in the Deborah Milkey case. And there's a lawsuit by Deborah Milkey against the state of Arizona that is ongoing right now in federal court. And people ought to look that up and find out. She was in jail for 22 years on death row. And then finally it got before a federal judge and said, wait a minute. The person who did this has eight counts of lying before the before a jury. The detective lied in her case. There was no reporting of it. They said that she confessed. So they put her on death row. 
and she stayed there for 22 years until she's 50 years old. She can no longer have a child. Her child was murdered. Well, the last thing that I read in federal court was that she subpoenaed the remaining of the two people who killed her, her child for a deposition. So that deposition has probably already taken place. But the deposition is that Deborah Milky had nothing at all to do with any of this. And once this comes out in federal court, the federal court is going to rule in favor of Deborah Milky and there will be a lawsuit, a judgment against the state of Arizona. But people need to follow these cases. You're not following the cases. You're not looking up case law. You don't even know how to write a damn motion. Let me, let me say what happens when a lawyer writes to the court. He says, I move the court to change the baby's diaper. Wrong. I move the court to issue an order to change the baby's diaper. The only thing that a judge does is enter orders. He doesn't do the job. But if a lawyer says it the wrong way, it's okay. If you say it the wrong way, you lose. You don't know how to write a motion. That's one of the problems. I write legal paper every day. I have a question. Can a lawyer tell you that they're not willing to file a motion even though you have all the evidence and they told you that all you needed was to cast this psych about what you cast and they said, oh, now we're not going to write this motion. I don't have the justification to do it now. You hired them to represent you. They are representing you in their viewpoint. Appointed. But they are, doesn't matter. They are one of the problems. She the refused. lawyers are the problem. Then you just get a good they are an officer of the court. You, can't get a, you cannot get an honest lawyer. The only way to win is to represent yourself. That's it. And you're not going to win if you represent yourself and you don't do it right. The, the, the thing is with attorneys, the is stacked. attorneys, they owe their allegiance to the British Crown. Yes. Yes, well, they the are an officer of the court, okay? They're not there to present your case. Because when these courts appoint you an attorney, that another automatically enemy. deems you incompetent in that court. Yes. Okay. Now, I've done a lot of research, so I, I can explain Arizona's court system when I get to take the stand here. Oh, it's, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the problem is by the time you learn everything you need to know, <laughs> it's, too it's too late. It's too late. Fifteen months has passed. Right. Well, hindsight is always twenty twenty, but we have found a way to keep going. And I'll also explain that here. One of, the, one of the things we need to get real proficient in is filing federal court documents. You're not going to get justice in Arizona. You can only go to the federal court and get justice. That's the only place. And by then your 15 months are up and, the, the and you're done. You're, you're, you're done. Then you've got to do it, you've got to do it in front of the behind. Court. And your yeah. children are ruined by that time. Oh yes. They're, they're brainwashed. They've been stuck on the syndrome. Yep. Yes. And yep. Declared to have uh, social problems, so they're, they've been given drugs because now they get more money for it. Right. Well, we need to find out who the ten lawyers are that brought federal court cases against the state of Arizona and mimic everything they do, plagiarize their damn documents. That's what we need to do. If they're still alive. Oh, they're still going. The are going. Are somewhere to be found. And be. Tucson is, is notorious for the pedophile ring. Mm -hmm. Tucson is full of guns. Yeah. Yeah. They just must have got a monster guy. A problem. Yeah, big problem. The chief of police, isn't it? Well, sorry I'm too loud. It's okay. That's a good thing. I like Shut up. It's a good thing. The world here. We like it loud. <laughs> I've said too much already. Okay. Okay. Oh, but I'm 75 and I don't give a damn. Woo! No. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Next. Okay. I'll go ahead and get you. Okay. Carla Johnson is going to go ahead. I know. Sorry. Okay. This, uh,
uh, it might be a good time for me to put my five dollars in. I don't have two cents. I got five dollars. Uh, my name is Carla Johnson. I am Sarah Elizabeth's mother. Um, to kind of give you a background of who I am and what I have done and what I do, um, CPS, and I'm just, I know it's DCS now, but just for, for sake of understanding, we're just going to call it CPS because it's the same criminal organization. In 2009, uh, well, 2008, Sarah gave birth to her first child, Isaiah. Um, and she was only 18. She's now 28 years old and still doesn't have her children. But uh, Isaiah was taken uh, at 14 months old, and it was all because of medical malpractice. Uh, her doctor gave her medication to induce her labor. And after she left Arrowhead Hospital and went to deliver another baby at a different hospital, she ordered that my daughter be given medication to stop her labor. At the same time. So she's in labor for two days. At 2.52 in the morning on the 26th of March in 2008, Isaiah was delivered by C-section, but by this time it was too late because the cord was wrapped around his neck. He had uh, oxygen deprivation. And at seven months old, after going to several neurologists, we found out that he was uh, diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Okay. So, the doctor that committed the medical malpractice called the social worker at the hospital. By 10 o'clock that morning, that social worker was in that room with my daughter, giving her emotional support. Well, this is where the tracking started because we got a lawyer to, to do the medical malpractice lawsuit. And I called the doctor, uh, the OB doctor, her doctor. I said, get your checkbook out because we're going to sue you. So CPS stalked my daughter and Isaiah and found the moment in time when they could come and seize him without a warrant. And they claimed it was our medical neglect, not the hospital. So every time Sarah had a child, her second son was born in October of 2009, they put the hit list out, CPS put the hit list out to seize him directly from the hospital. In June of 2011, she had her third son, Josiah. Now, this time it took her clear to Oklahoma to give birth to this child. To stay away from the state. So she could bring that little boy home. Yeah, to protect him. The doctor in Oklahoma wanted the records from here. And those three little letters, CPS, alerted Oklahoma. So Arizona told Oklahoma, take that baby. So they did. The hospital room was stormed with hospital security, Tulsa County Sheriff's deputies, and lots of uh, social workers from the Department of Health and Human Services in Oklahoma. She didn't even get to say her goodbye to her son. They just took him. So we went through court from 2009 to 2014. They came and they, she had another, another little boy. Her fourth son, Jaden, was born in 2000 and June of 2013. We wised up by then. She went into the hospital to have that child in, in confidence, confidentiality. So that if anybody came to the hospital and wanted to see if she was registered, they had no record. Well, Jaden came home for eight months. So that's because I didn't give him a birth certificate or a social security card. Right. Disturbing. Yeah. So CPS in 2009 makes the allegations of medical neglect. Well, by the time these CPS workers come in, seize, and kidnap her fourth son, they have completely morphed the allegations. Now, all of a sudden, she's using heroin and selling heroin out of a home that we didn't even, we didn't even live at. 
and all of a sudden she's diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Mol yeah, multiple personality. But in the same document, this CPS worker, whose previous job, by the way, used to be a salesman at Old Navy, says mother has not been interviewed at this time. So if mother stated that she was using and selling heroin, and mother stated that she had schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, who in the heck did she state that to? That was all in the same report. It was all in the same report. So, Arizona's got a good business going on here. And it's a multi-billion dollar business. And I call it a state-sanctioned kidnap-for-profit scheme. And like Steve said, it's not broken. It's not broken. It's a well-oiled machine. And it's designed to seize children and destroy families. And it's all for money. All for money. Now, I'd like to add, too, that Sarah had 14 court-appointed attorneys that did absolutely nothing. 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 36 caseworkers were involved in her case. And at the end, when I got through with them, a lot of them quit. 38 judges, all the way from dependency courts to the Court of Appeals, the Arizona Supreme Court, District Court, Federal Court, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. All those judges conspired, colluded, and covered up the crimes by Arizona DCS and the Attorney Generals. Mm -hmm. They all, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get any relief in federal court, I can tell you this right now. Because we've been there and done that. The hamsters will. Okay. So, you wanna know how this business got started. It really started back in 1974. Walter Mondale promoted the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. It's called CAP CAPTA. It was that act that, that defined child abuse and neglect. Now, <coughs> this began feeling, feeding massive amounts of federal funds to the states. Do you have a, the rest of the citation to that quote? It says Mondale himself became gravely concerned that the states would no, create the, a business the, and would the, ultimately the learn citation to the reference. how to cash in on our children. No, I, I didn't print that off. Okay. But now, you go to 1990, jump to 1997 when the Clintons passed the Adoption and Safe Families Act. Now we're getting to the root of the problem. Right, yeah. and we already know we already know Clinton's reputations, yep. no, both Hillary and Bill. Also, truth and sentencing, which is basically the same thing that private prisons do here, and another corrupt level. They just manufacture these these ideas and crimes and situations. Well, Richard Gellis was one of the authors of this uh, Adoption Safe Families Act, and he said. You're gonna make mistakes in terms of sweeping up children into the system who might not belong in the system. And those children are almost always going to be from poor families, from minority families, from Spanish-speaking or non-majority language families. When we wrote AFSA, we knew that the mistakes we were willing to tolerate was having nets not be, not, the nets be not quite as fine in pulling people in who might not belong here. And that's exactly what they've done. They've, they've created a business from the Walter Mondale Act in 1974 in ASFA in 1997. Multi-billion dollar business. I've seen reports where Arizona went from making a half a million dollars in adoption bonuses to over 11 million dollars. And Arizona brags that they have the highest national adoption day in in the United States. Governor Doug does that all the time. Right. Now, to explain to you the Arizona courts. And I'm 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 not going from memory today. <clears throat> These Arizona courts are privately held companies, believe it or not. DCS is a privately held company as well. 
They all have Dun & Bradstreet numbers. In fact, DCF has several Dun & Bradstreet numbers. So what is, a, what is a Dun & Bradstreet number used for? It's to get a credit rating, and it's to get contracts and grants from the federal government. That's what they use the DMB numbers for. These juvenile courts are not courts of law. They're not courts of record. What they are is administrative courts. Okay, they're dealing in administrative law. And it's run by the persons that are sitting on that bench in their black robes as, and they're acting as administrative law judge. So what's an administrative law judge? Basically, they enforce administrative law. They're a mere extension of the agency for review purposes of a ministerial clerk for an agency, and they're not acting in their judicial capacity. These are judges. In addition, all the judges in these uh, Arizona's juvenile courts belong to a private membership association. And it's called the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, which is a 501c3 organization. 501c3 nonprofit. Yep. Just like the churches. They, they train the judges, they train the judicial officers, and the attorneys involved with Arizona's children and families. You may disagree with this, but I'm going to make a bold statement here, and I, Doug Ducey is the ringleader oh, yeah, he's the, of this he's the organized kidnapping ring, is what they are. He's well, the head of it. He's the ringleader, and Brnovich yeah. and, and, and Greg, Greg McKay, McKay are his strong men. Yeah. They're the ones that's running this criminal organization. Ducey knows of the crimes that's going on. Greg McKay knows, so does Brnovich, and Tom Horn knew, and Terry Goddard knew. Joe Arpaio knew. Joe Arpaio, Paul Pinzone, they all know what's going on. Yeah. We need to start holding Ducey accountable to the people, to us. Yeah. Okay? Now, you go talk to your. The Arizona legislators, all 90 of them, know who I am. Mm -hmm. And one legislator told me one day when, when Crystal and I went down to talk to, uh, to talk to them, he said, Carla, you've got all the legislators sitting on the edge of their seat, so you must be doing something right. I have been, um, literally, I was thrown out of court, the courthouse in Oklahoma, by, I, I was uh, accosted by several Tulsa County Sheriff's deputies. I have been uh, escorted out of the courthouses here in Phoenix, both the juvenile court in, in, uh, on Durango and the one in Mesa. If I'm seen at another parent's court hearing, I think the Attorney General's it must have a picture of me on their computer screen as a screensaver because they always demand that I leave the court hearing. And why? Because I expose criminal judges. I expose their, them legislating from the bench and committing crimes. And all the judges that I exposed in my daughter's case, they either got out of Dodge and they retired or they moved to a different department. Yeah. But will they have a picture of you in the courts on the wall? Judge Norm Davis allowed the Superior Court Marshals to conduct an unlawful and illegal background check on me, go to the DMV and get my picture from my driver's license, and put it on a poster called a bolo. Be on the lookout. And posted that picture of me in the courthouse saying if they see me in this courthouse, they're supposed to notify court security. Yeah. Oh. I don't have a criminal record. I mean, the height of my criminal record is a parking ticket. You are, your picture is also with the Attorney General's office, guaranteed. Probably. Mine has been there for years. 
I have the same problem that you have. Mm -hmm. They see me going to court, whoever I'm in there helping is going to lose. So I stay out in the courthouse. When I seen the psychiatrist, uh, it came out in court that uh, I wasn't truly honest about my criminal background because I hadn't mentioned the fact that I had been in, in prison for five years. And uh, the problem was uh, I didn't know I had been in prison for five years because <laughs> it never happened. But because I didn't tell him that, you know, because I didn't tell him that I was in prison for five years because I didn't know it, um, it turned out that I wasn't honest with him. Right. But they can lie. Just make it, make it up. Don't feel bad. Michigan told me because I wasn't honest about my military background that I wasn't honest. I need to tell you that I served in the military. They none of your business. Here is a document right here that shows that the Department of Child Safety is a privately held company. And according to Arizona Revised Statutes 41-3024.06, their contract with the state of Arizona terminates July 1st, 2024. So now I also have the Department of Child Safety's Dun and Bradstreet report. I've got their credit rating. The guy next to you. Oh, I got their credit rating, and it says here that they are a business, and it says here that um, they sell to undetermined, and the employees Dun and Bradstreet list them as having two employees, which includes the owner. A group of us got together and purchased this report from Dun and Brand Street for $122. What you're saying, they're actually, they're actually a business, a corporation. They are a privately held company. Yes, 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 exactly. Right. Now, what I also uncovered in my research is that children that are wards of the state can be used as guinea pigs. Medical experience. Uh, med medical experience. Right. So part of the problem is the federal government. The Code of Federal Regulations, Title 45, issued by the um, Department of Health and Human Services, which also help funds DCS and the state. It says here, 46.409 wards. Children who are wards of the state or any other agency, institution, or entity can be included in research. Okay, so this child that can be used in research needs an advocate. So. A DCS steps in there, the child's advocate, right? And I've got this all laid out exactly how they, um, I, I connected all the dots in Arizona of how they, they use these children. So I started searching and I found a contract between Phoenix Children's Hospital and DCS. DC, uh, DCS pays Phoenix Children's Hospital $865 for every child that they see. Seize. And I have the contract right here, along with the signature page and the amendments and um, the, procure, the procurement determination. And it's all signed, sealed, and delivered. Now, Phoenix Children's Hospital also has a contract with TGIN. And like Steve said earlier, Governor Ducey's on the board of directors for TGIN. Even child help. With child help, I have, once we start going in and doing all this research, all these agencies start pulling all this information off the internet. So you can't find it anymore. So child help takes in these, these children and do forensic exams, 
and they have foster care homes and stuff. So, Ducey's on here, Janice Brewer, this is their uh, advisory board of directors. Brnovich is on here. Joe Arpaio was on here. Michelle Reagan. Representatives Mayor Greg Stanton, Bill Montgomery's on here. The Chief of Police was Joe Yonner. Um, lots of state representatives, but you know what? Child Help pulled this off their, the, off their website, so you can't get the Board of Directors anymore. So, you know, our legislators have a vested interest because a lot of them have group homes and they're foster parents. So, my question is, when are we going to start holding Arizona responsible? CCS and Governor Ducey. Yeah, it takes a class action suit. No, no. Our legislators, um, I researched and I found the legislator's handbook. And in chapter 9 of the legislator's handbook, it says that they have the empowerment and authority to impeach and indict elected officials and judges who have breached their responsibilities and breached the public trust. So what is DCS doing? What is Governor doing, D Ducey doing? You know, what are our legislators doing? You know, they're they're violating the public trust. They're are they not? They're money off of it. That's what they're doing. Even the, the House and the Senate have done in Brad Street numbers. And it says they're privately held companies as well. All the courts are privately held companies. So we need to, you know, when, when our legislators come back in session, we need to march down here every day and tell them that we demand accountability of what is going on in Arizona with our children and our families. Now I'll tell you one thing is that Judges have unlimited immunity for every act they do except for criminal acts. No, I don't believe that, Bob. I believe that judges have given themselves immunity, and that doesn't that doesn't stand with me at all. One, okay. one, not There's one case bit. Law, case law that backs it up. Well, I I don't care about Nobody case law. To the case law. What I care about is our, our inalienable God-given rights to our children. And no state can infringe on that right that we have. My daughter and I, and Crystal, Leanna Smith and Daryl Smith, we went to an international court, a human rights tribunal. I started, I, I, when I was being prosecuted for um, falsely being accused of contempt of court for violating an, a gag order, which by the way I won and proved that the judge committed perjury, I decided I better have a plan B in case these criminals throw me in jail. So I found a private attorney general that was going to get me out of jail in case it went south. Well, eventually he started working with the Human Rights Tribunal International. And he, he got a hold of me and said, Carla, we can do your case now. We got the foundation to do your case. So my daughter and I, Crystal, Leanna Smith and Daryl Smith, we all filed, um, we filed our cases with the Human Rights Tribunal International. We got indictments against the state of Arizona for human trafficking. And the state of Arizona didn't respond. And the Attorney General says, no, we're not going to respond. Ha ha ha. Well, the indictments have charged Arizona with human trafficking for violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Convention of the Rights on the Child. And there's another treaty that we discovered 
that they have violated. And it is called Let me find it here. It's a really long name, and I cannot, for the life of me. Oh, here it is. The United States Inc., which is the corporate United States, which of course is a 10 mile radius of one around Washington, D.C., they signed into a treaty back in 2005, and it's, a, it's called, it's entitled. Protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, which supplements the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. February 2017, um, President Trump came out with an executive order against transnational organized crime and human trafficking. The Human Rights Tribunal has issued an order for the state of Arizona to return my grandsons. They haven't been served with that order yet because we're still calculating the damages. Now, in my daughter's case alone, there is 278 violations. Each violation has a monetary value in damages of $750,000 per violation. So I believe the state of Arizona probably owes my daughter about $250 million right now, just for one, just for her case. Let me, let me back you up. I'm backing you up in this one, one part of the Constitution on page 47 of the little book, mm -hmm. in the second paragraph. The Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land right. and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby mm. anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. That's you are right on it. That's on page 47 under article 6. So what I'm trying to say is that it's easy to file your case with the Human Rights Tribunal International Court. <coughs> um, all it takes is a notarized affidavit of who, what, when, where, and why. And your evidence to prove your innocence. Now the one thing about the Human Rights Tribunal International, it is composed of seven ministers. Do you think that these people sitting in these black robes in these courthouses in Arizona have any Allegiance to God? I don't think so. No, they don't. Because I haven't seen it. No. Yeah, they, they ha you're right, David. They have an allegiance to to Bail. money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I brought a piece of paper that I'll, I'll give you guys if you want the website address um, to to submit your case. You know, if enough people submit their cases, and and it goes up and beyond. We'll get all the children home because that's what this court wants to do. They want to shut DCS down. They want to shut CPS down, not just in Arizona. Shut it down nationally. Get rid of them. Stop taking our children and stop destroying our families. Yeah, yeah they do. They want to abolish. CPS. Didn't, Arizona, didn't uh, they abolish CPS, but then they just changed the name? No, they didn't abolish it. They just changed the name. That's it. Yep. And it was, uh, it was an executive governor's order to abolish it. But it's the order. 
So they collapse the name and abolish the name and just change the name. Yeah. Change the door. Exactly. Basically, you get rid of one director and you put a different name on the door, and now it's a whole different uh, thing. It's all been changed. But see. CPS used to be under the umbrella of the Arizona Department of Economic Security, yep. but now DCS is a cabinet level organization that answers to Ducey. They, Greg McKay answers direct, directly to Ducey. But see why, if Governor Ducey only makes 90 some thousand dollars a year, why did he give Greg McKay a 33% raise? Greg McKay is making over $164,000 a year now. Do you know, I went into the recorder's office, and do you know how many times Doug Ducey has refinanced his house? Where in the hell is he getting that money? Oops, I cussed. <laughs> Sorry. Nope, that's just passion. Don't worry about it. You know, and, and the judges, they... they they do all these warranty deeds, but you know what? All of theirs are redacted. Well, isn't the Maricopa County Recorders the public website, public information? But no, no, they redact the judges. How many times they refinance their homes? I'm telling you, it's blood money off the backs of our children and the destruction of our families. So let me know. I, I said my $10 worth today. Uh, let me know if you guys want the website to file your affidavits and submit your evidence. Get your case before a real court. Okay? A real court. I would like the information. A court of record. Well, it's an international court and they have jurisdiction everywhere. Through the website. Yeah, you need I will give it to you. Technically, a part of the Superior Court. The Pima County, Ju Pima County Juvenile Court is housed in a separate building on Ajo Way near Keno Hospital, now called UMC South. Now, in that first sentence, they say that it's technically a part of Superior Court. Do those words have meaning? If it's technically a part, does that mean that it's exactly the same? No. No. Okay, it's technically a part. Now, here's the craziest thing. The Superior Court in Arizona has what's called general jurisdiction. They can hear criminal cases, they can hear civil cases. But what if you're not really in superior court? What if you're in something else that's technically under the superior court but not the superior court? Because the superior court has rules, right? The superior court has rules. Now, when they bring you into a superior court, you're going to expect for it to be fair because they have rules that say it's supposed to be fair. But what if you're not in superior court? Could you possibly have different rules? There you go. Watch this. See, we got to go back and look at what they're saying, and we have to be critical because these people are setting up to take our little ones, and we all say it's not fair from our own gut and our own heart. But we don't know why it's not fair. Watch this. Throughout the state, the juvenile court operates under a different set of rules and procedures than those used in other civil proceedings. That make you mad yet? We've all heard that. You're going to a court. They don't tell you on the books that you're under a different set of rule and procedures. They let you go there and try to fight for your kids thinking that you have to prove that you weren't wrong. But how do you prove a negative? If something didn't happen and it did not exist, how do you prove that it did not exist? They should have to prove that it exists. They're not using evidence. Yeah, there you go. They should be proving that you've done wrong as plaintiffs. As the accuser, they should be bringing evidence to say you did wrong. But what if they don't care about evidence, but you think they do? So you spend the whole case fighting, trying to show that you were not wrong, and they don't care if you were wrong, don't care about evidence or anything like that. They want their paycheck. How would it make you feel? Watch this. <laughs> it gets worse. Okay. Watch this. Juvenile court also has its own culture or way of doing things that is less formal and in many ways more innovative than other courts. Now, in an Article Three court, when can the court, a court based on the Constitution, give itself innovations or make itself different to accomplish something? They can't. I don't think innovative is the word I would use. 
<laughs> this is the guardian ad litem handbook. It's written by attorneys. They're telling them what they're doing and what their goal is. Watch this. It goes on to say, in theory, in theory, not in law, in theory, the juvenile court is not in the business of finding fault. They don't want to see if you're in trouble or not. They don't want to prove you as wrong. It's not in the business of finding fault, assessing blame, or meeting out punishment. Now, is that the exact opposite of what you thought when you went? Didn't you think that they were trying to see if you were right or wrong and you were worried about going to jail so you didn't want to talk too loud, you didn't want to disrespect the person with the black robe in the front, you didn't want to speak too much, you wanted to listen to the attorney that they gave you because you thought that you were in trouble, right? You thought that your life might be on the line, your kid's life might be on the line, and they wanted to prove you wrong, and you wanted to make sure that you didn't do anything to let them think that you were wrong or aggressive or mean or mad, even though somebody's snatching your kids in front of your face, you're really upset, you don't like it, but you feel like you have to uh, exercise extra patience because they're trying to find out if you're wrong or right. But here's the thing though. Did you think that's what they were looking for? And you thought they were on your side. At the time. There you go. You the attorney right is going to the truth will come out. That's what you think. You think that it's going to be just because courts that are made based on the constitution and which is maybe based on the Bible, you think that it's about right and wrong. You think if I just tell the truth and do right, these people will see the truth. But they are saying that they don't care about seeing the truth. They don't want to see the truth. The truth is not part of their battle. The truth is not part of their battle. So you go into these so-called courts, right? You go into these so-called courts and you fight and you will spend the trial trying to prove your innocence. You'll spend the trial trying to show evidence and evidence in these courts as we have, as we have read does not matter. So you're fighting a ghost. Yeah, you're fighting something that's not there. So how do you win a battle that you don't even know who your enemy is and you don't know how to fight and there's no rules that you can use. And then they give you what they call attorneys and the attorneys they give to you just turn you over to their jurisdiction not telling you that they don't have jurisdiction over you. But they turn you over to the jurisdiction because if you never did anything wrong doesn't it take for somebody to be wrong to have a court start to move forward? You need an injured party, right? Somebody had to do something wrong for a court to say, hey, we're going to take on this case. But they say that they don't care about wrongdoing. So what I want to ask is, what is it that we're dealing with? What is it? The satanic code. I'm just guessing. Here's a question I have for y'all. Is it the state of Arizona that is hearing your cases? When you go into the dependency court, is it the state of Arizona that's hearing your case? Nope. Is it? Nope. Okay, I'm going to show you guys something else. What would you do? Wait, is there anybody who wants to say that it might be Arizona hearing your case in the dependency court? Is this? Okay, so from what we've seen now, are you in the Superior Court of Arizona? No. You're not in the Superior Court of Arizona? Okay, so if you're in the Superior Court of Arizona and you decide to go against the rules of the Superior Court of Arizona, what is that called? Contempt. Contempt of court. So can a CPS worker hear a judge in the actual Superior Court, Arizona, give an order and just say, we're not going to listen to it? No. So what is it then if you are inside of a courtroom and a caseworker decides that the judge says, send, your, send these kids back home, as we saw in the Pellerin case, and a caseworker says, I'm going to call the Attorney General. The Attorney General says, I don't worry about it. And they say, I'm not going to return these kids, even though the judge said, return the kids. Well, that's, the judge always follows what CPS says. Why? Why are they following? Because it's a private company. Here's what's happening. They, they trained to do it. There you yes. go. The yes. judges are Otherwise being trained. Judge. The judges are being trained by CPS. If you look, go look up this name. It's called the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. The National Council of Juvenile and Family, Family Court Judges is, is a membership organization. And this membership organization has 30,000 members, guardian ad litems, police officers, judges, uh, 
uh, people in the medical community and they all come together to hear cases. Now if you want, I'll give you a scholarly journal article um, that deals with due process, uh, the, the issues of due process in these courts. And in that uh, document, it's going to tell you that the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges is a membership organization of courts that are hearing these cases. So the reason the rules can be different is because you're not in an actual court. You're in the midst of a membership organization. And the reasons that they can run by different rules and ignore the judge is because when you have an agency that is bringing on a judge that is signed under the same pay, they're all paid up under what's called Title IV-E. When they're all paid up under the same pay, the judge becomes a ministerial clerk for the agency for superior reviewing purposes. So what they're doing is, is they're reviewing what the agency is doing to see if there's anything that's against procedure, but they're not using the law. They're, they're looking for things to be against procedure, but not using the law. So if somebody runs over your rights and tramples them, does it matter to them? Not at all. When you're inside of a private membership organization, I'll give you an example of a private membership association. So when you deal with an attorney, right? When attorney adds something into your file and lies on you, right? And you try to go tell the police, what did the police say? They don't care. They can't do anything about it, right? They tell you, oh, well we can't deal with this because it's a civil matter. Oh, we can't deal with this because we have no jurisdiction yeah, over the attorneys. It's always an excuse, jurisdiction. You know why they don't have jurisdiction over the attorneys? Because a membership association is created as a trust or a private membership and no federal government official, no state official, or no police officer has jurisdiction over the trust. So when they bring you into that so-called court, they're trafficking you into a trust. They're saying, hey, you're not part of our team, but come on in here and sit and be the defendant, and we're going to act like you're in trouble, and you're going to do everything we say, and we're going to give you a whole bunch of minute, minute orders, not minute orders, a whole bunch of minute orders, and you're going to do everything we say, and we're going to act like we're in real court. And you're the only one in the room that don't know that it's a game, that they're not going by the law. So then they give you orders. Y'all seen these minute orders, right? How come they don't sign it? How come they give you something that says, it is ordered to give your kids to CPS and no judge signs it, then they give it to you? Because if they sign it, it's against the law. If they sign it, they know that they're showing that they, they ordered you to do something or got you to believe you were ordered to do something, but if they don't sign it and just give it to you, you assume that you were told to give your kid up. So it becomes a blank piece of paper. There you go, it's just a blank piece of paper, but we read it and we say, oh shucks, we're in trouble. They said I better give up my kid or I might go to jail, so I'm just gonna do it. So these are the games that are being played by people who are public officials sometimes and at other times they're not. Now I know that sounds strange, right? But I'm gonna give you an example based off of Title IV-D. Who knows what Title IV-D is? Anybody know what child support is? Okay, people know what child support is. Child support, here's what happens. You are told that you have to pay $3,000 as the non-custodial parent, right? Now that money, everybody thinks that money just goes to the mom or whatever and that's it, right? That's what child support looks like, right? Let me tell you what's really happening. $3,000 comes from the non-custodial parent and part of it goes to the other parent. Then they go into Social Security and grab another $3,000 out of thin air and then they take it and separate it up between the, ju the judges, the different uh, people involved in the case, and then they take 50% of it or so, and they donate it to the general fund. So there's billions of dollars going into the state treasury, and people are wondering, like, well, where are all this child support and all this money from the kids that are getting taken? Where is it going? CPS keeps a part of it and all the players break some up, and then they take a percentage of it and donate it to the general fund. So now think about this. If the judge who is hearing the case is also getting paid money in the case, can it be legitimate? Nope, it's double dipping. Nope. Can't do that, right? So what if the judge is making a decision on the case and it's inside of a private membership organization and everybody there just acts like they're going through a case? Is that different?
That's different, right? Because if the judge isn't a state judge, none of your paper says that Arizona, the state of Arizona is bringing you into a dependency case. It says in the matter of the name of your kids. It did not say the state of Arizona is taking your kids. The state of Arizona did not take your kids. You know who the state of Arizona is? All of us, the people. So which person did you hurt for us to come take your kid from you? The state of Arizona, sometimes they want to say it's the people and sometimes they want to say it's the land. But here's the problem. The state of Arizona is not bringing you into a court saying that you hurt your child unless you're going into a criminal court and 95% of the people who didn't deal with CPS did not go to a criminal court. They're not trying to prove you did anything wrong because they have no evidence that you did anything wrong. So it's not about wrong, it's not about evidence, it's not about what's right, it's not about you having your little ones that God gave you. If you believe in the Bible, God tells us that children are an inheritance from the Lord. The problem is, is that the state says that children are the property of the state. Which has to take and do with the fact that your social security and your birth certificate. The social security trust, the birth certificate, and what they call parents patriarch. But also, David, it all goes back to Rome. And it all goes back to Rome. Because when that mother, mm -hmm. when that umbilical cord is, is cut at the hospital after the mother gives birth to that to their new son or new daughter, once the umbilical cord is cut, the Roman the Roman church says that that child is now abandoned and belongs to the state. And see, here's, here's the problem. This is some, some terrible stuff that's done. So we end up in a situation where the people in these courts tell us that the state has jurisdiction over our kids. So when they got you to sign your marriage, uh, your marriage license, they believe that they made themselves the top dogs and you and your husband was just uh, lower level um, parties to this agreement. And so anything that comes from you and your husband or you and your wife, they call it uh, fruit of the marriage. Fruit of the marriage. So your children are products of the marriage and belong to them. The only problem with all that is nobody ever told you that when they got you to sign a contract. Nobody ever told you that when they got you to sign a birth certificate. Nobody ever told you that. See, anytime you're going to have a contract, there needs to be a meeting of the minds. It needs to be explained and understood what's happening. Full disclosure. They're not giving full disclosure, but they're now telling the people that we own your children. They're not telling the people. They're telling the parents we own your children. Because they're looking at your child like a company that belongs to them. And they're looking at themselves as the parent. And, and anybody in business, what do you call a company that is born out of another company? That's your parent company. Parent company and child company. So they're changing the language where, if we go back to the Bible times, the Bible says children are inheritance from the Lord. It's a gift from God to you. They're changing that definition to the state is giving you the right to have your little ones. Your child. So the state created a birth certificate, a document that they called a child with a birth date, but that's not your little. And so we get tricked. So we got to go back and we got to look and see. So we got to look at the, the order of operations. So here's how we can do that. Gotcha. All right. So we have your child, right? Your child. The state believes they created your child. But who really created your child? You did, right? I'm in debt. <laughs> you created your child. Now, now let's look. <laughs> Who created the state? My neighbor. <laughs> Who created the state? We did. We the people. The people, right? So who has the highest authority when it comes to earthly things? See, they've tricked us to believe we got to ask the state for permission to give us our kids back. We got to ask the state for permission to raise our kids, to homeschool them, to feed them more vegetables than meat, to not get them shot up with vaccinations. Whatever it is that you choose or you believe, they want to tell us they have the right to dictate to us what to do. The only problem is, is that the people created the state. The people created the Constitution. We just forgot who we are. As a matter of fact, we've been deceived out of who we are. See. Um, Back in the day, back in the day, people like Mr. Apache Bob, they were able to learn, well, and Ray, they were able to learn what was called civics. 
So they can go to school and learn about something called a habeas corpus. They can go to school and learn what happened in the Declaration of Independence. Now I'm 38 years old. Who under 38 knows what the Decla Declaration of Independence taught? Oh, you said under 38. Under 38, who knows? Nobody. Who under 38 can write their own habeas corpus? Nobody. Who under 38? Now, Miss, Mr. Apache Bob taught me exactly how to do it, and it was a blessing because the Supreme Court right over there kicked my habeas corpus out. But Mr. Apache Bob taught me something real deep about being one of the people. He let me know how when you write an affidavit and you show what the truth is, that your truth stands if they don't answer it. So he got me, got working with me. We did a habeas corpus, right? We did a habeas corpus, and we did it in the form of an affidavit. And I didn't understand in the beginning why God was telling me to do that. But they kicked the habeas corpus out after six months and would not let um, Doug Ducey make an answer. But the truth is, is that it's proven now that Doug du I mean, uh, Greg McKay got served with that habeas corpus six months ago and he ignored it. And that habeas corpus was in the form of an affidavit. That affidavit unrebutted stands as what? True. So now... Res judicata. There you go. Res judicata. Six, After 30 days, no done. answer. It is now fact. There you go. Now, this is what's deep. So who knows what a court of record is? Anybody know what a court of record is? Okay. Now this is important, y'all, because Bob has done some classes. Ray has done some classes. People have set up for us to be able to learn stuff that's super important that nobody wants to tell us. See, if you're going to do trafficking and you're going to steal people's kids, you got to start with the people who were born in 1980 and raise them up to know not a dang thing. And when you raise them up to not know their rights, you can easily trample them in fake courts that are not courts of competent jurisdiction because they won't know anyway. And so we see where we have people who are teaching us how to reclaim what God has given to us. And so we got to take it seriously. We got to get to the point where we thirst for knowledge, we're hungry, we'll stay up to 2, 3, 4, 5 in the morning to learn the truth. But let me tell you the blessing of what happened. So a court of record is a court of the people. If somebody was going to take anything from you, they should be, be, be bringing you into a court of record. A court of record is a court that does not go by statutes and codes, but it goes by the common law. The common law is, does this make sense? That's what the common law is. Should I be able to take your kid just because I say that you did something wrong with no proof? Is that, that's common sense, right? Right? You might someday do something wrong. <laughs> Maybe, you know? Should we allow that in an actual real court? No. no. So in a court of record, there is no statutes. We don't go by the statutes. We go by the common law. So that means that a real man can bring his issue to the court and a, a jury can make a decision if something was right or wrong and you can make the judge a magistrate. He sits on the side, shuts his mouth. He doesn't judge a dang thing. Now, if we had that same thing for the people in family law, it would be a problem. Because in family law, they used to have um, juries in these courts. And you know what happened? I can show you documents from people who worked there saying, oh, the only people who liked the, the, the juries was the, was the parents. You know why? Because the people won't deal with you stealing kids for money. That's the truth. And so these people who are part of this membership association that are trafficking our kids are able to do it because we have not learned. But if we stop and take the time to get serious, it won't take long before enough people know the truth and the whole state changes. Because when people, how many of you would ever believe that Guardian Net Lightings would speak that way until you heard me read it off of their own document? And if you don't believe that it's, it's a real document, go on my Facebook and you'll see all the government documents. I take them and I break them down. You can see them lie right in front of your face. But the thing is, is that we've been tricked. The truth has been suppressed. The law has been suppressed. And we got to get to the point where we turn things around and, and get educated. And we can't do it like two years from now. We got to do it fast. Because these people are snatching our kids at about 900 a month with no warrants, with no evidence. And they don't care about evidence. And we've been fighting, trying to prove that we weren't wrong. That was not even the right fight. But if we learn to open up courts of records, let me tell you about this. I think I got like two minutes left, so I'm going to hurry up. 
If we learned about these affidavits, right? You can write an affidavit, it can be unrebutted, 30 days, it stands as true. After that truth is there on the record, every other court of record in the, in the nation has to go along with that court of record's judgment. So if your affidavit says that CPS stole your little ones, that, uh, not CPS, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't deal with CPS, we deal with men and women. Jessica Wilson lied to take my kid. Jessica Wilson said that if I don't sign this document that she gonna take my kids, so I'll never see him again. You take that extortion, put it in your affidavit, and you do it correctly, and you send it, you get it sent off to them. When they ignore it, that's fine. Now the judgment that comes from that, the court of record, the actual real court, is going to have to side with that. And so you go through something that seems like a loss. They ignore you. You see, it seems like a loss. They take your kid in a fake CPS court. But then when you go to the big boy court, the court of record where the real people go, who gonna swear to something being the truth that CPS won't do. See, CPS agents won't tell that I am telling the truth 100% this person smacked their kid, I know for a fact. They won't do that. They'll say, well, I kind of believe that the person who told me that something possibly happened was possibly telling the truth. And we're going to certify that. Well, who cares? What about doctors making stuff up? Oh, well, here's the thing, too. So there was a case in um, Tennessee where you'll see where the doctors, or the, the doctors and people who do any type of test who are getting paid a salary by the same Title IV e-money or CPS, their, their judgments are void too. And so this is the problem. We don't know this stuff, and we're in an administrative court. Now, in an administrative court, administrative court has to deal with business, right? So, or how an administration is going to be run. If you're one of the people, can an administrative court tell you what you got to do? Oh, let's do it this way. I'm part of your business. Watch this. Let's do it this way. How many people got told by CPS, you better go to all these classes, do this and do this, and you did it and they still took your kids, right? Now, how many people they got told, you better do this, 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 and this, and they're like, you're not going to tell me what to do. And you said, no, that was me. <laughs> all right? I was, like, I was like, super no. I'm like, you will not extort me. I don't, I don't negotiate with terrorists. I'm going to find out how to destroy you, and I promise you, you will be destroyed, period. I'm not going to beg you to give me my kids back. I'm not going to beg you to see my kid. We will have a war. And, I'll, and, and this is the thing, what I believe about war, and I'll let y'all go. You can, you can go and you can uh, have somebody try to fight you, and then you try to bend over backward to please them when you know they're wrong. Or you can say, forget it. We're going to go to war, and I will fight you tooth and nail. I will, find your, I will find your weakness. I won't sleep. I won't rest. If I don't have to eat, I won't eat. I will find it, and then I'm going to do something that they won't do. See, the people who are stealing our kids, they put gag orders on all of us, right? First time they see you say something on Facebook, they're like, gag them, shut up, <laughs> right? We need to find out what it is that they don't want. What they don't want is exposure. They don't want people to know the truth. They don't want people to tell each other the rape that's happening behind closed doors. They don't want the people to know that they took your kid and gave it to a rapist. That's the truth. So they try to gag you. They don't want you to know all these bad things that they're doing behind closed doors. The guardian that lied and getting paid $500 per hearing, per child. And they have 15 minute hearings, playing games, acting like they're looking for the best interest of the child that ain't talked about nowhere in the law. You can't find that in the law. Best interest is psychobabble. It's a banking term. Yeah, it's, it's like psychology. It well, what's the best interest? Work. Whatever we choose today. So you're going to fight best interest rather than using the law. But here's the thing about this war. The real battle comes when you tell the people. Because they don't want the people to know. So the very moment that the people start getting educated, this whole thing flips over and everybody's kids come back. That's why they want you to shut up. That's why they want you to get, get the gag order. That's why they want to abuse you and not let you see your kid. Because they think that it's going to make you have fear and shut your mouth. And so for me, I look and say, I still believe in the people. I believe in every single one of you. There's a lot of people who sit at home eating egg sandwiches right now talking about they miss their kid. But there's real people who are here today who believe in standing up, who want to fight, who's tired of the bull, who's serious about getting their little ones back. Now Jesus started with only 12 people, and we got more than 12 people here. So I believe with all my heart, with all my heart that we got some real people that have decided to stand up. And we should not be sad about humble beginnings. We should not be sad about not knowing enough right now. 
because we got some wise people who are here who can give us what it is that we need to be able to stand up and fight. The choice is ours. And we have to make the decision. Am I going to learn or am I going to let wise people die with their knowledge? That's the truth. So we, all I want to say is let's get together and start learning. You know, these men and women have held classes for us to have a chance to learn. And I'll tell you, because of that affidavit, I didn't understand right away what he was telling me to do. And he wouldn't just give me all of it. He made me go look. He gave me a packet and said, go look, go read, go study. And the more I start reading, the more hungry I got and the more simple it became to me. And I realized, like, shucks, I can open up my own court of record where I'm the king. Where I'm bringing the law and we're going to judge by law and I can make the judge sit in the corner and not say a dang thing except for keeping court in the And the jury tells if this is right or wrong. So all that evidence you got where they lied on you, all that evidence you got where they changed stories, all that evidence you got, you could put that in an affidavit form, turn it in, drop it off at that little Supreme Court building right there for free. Let them disregard it on purpose, no biggie, and then you open up your own court and take that judgment and add it with your case and win. Because they can't say that you lost when you're the king of the court. When you're the queen of the court, they can't say you lost. That means that you can make an order for your kids to come back. And you have proof of all the fraud and nobody can say you're lying because they didn't do it when you gave them time. Go ahead, Bob. There is an idea right there. You go back into federal court, you write your own order, and you have a judge sign it in federal court to overcome Arizona's overthrown government. You see that? Yep, there you go. You see that? I have a question. Go ahead. So what would you say to your parents who are afraid to fight and do what, what we and what you guys are doing because we are threatened with our children. Well, here, here's the thing. So in Arizona, out of all the people, there's a gentleman uh, named Lawrence Espinosa on Facebook. He he does some deep research. He drops some crazy facts. I didn't see him. Here's one thing I found from Lawrence. Lawrence dropped a document that showed that like 99.8% of every single case that is heard for termination ends up with the state winning. That means that out of 100 kids, you wouldn't get a whole baby back. Think about that. 100 kids, you can't get back a whole baby. You can get 2% of baby, you get his leg back. Now, with that being said, huh? yeah, almost like spam. You're, you're, you're not, the odds are against you almost 100%. So the thing is, is they're taking everybody's kids and they're not giving them back, why be afraid? This is war. They're taking your kids. See. If a man on the street walked up and grabbed your baby right out of your hand, if they walked up and took this little guy right away, whoever he belongs to would be chasing me, right? Yeah. Yeah, right away. So the thing is, is that if you're at home and you're fearful, they're taking your kiss anyway. It's only a matter of time before they get to that 12 months or whatever it is they're looking for to snatch them away from you and throw them in another house and never let you see them again. Because you're hanging on to that thread. Yeah. Of belief in justice. Yeah, and, and you're believing. And they're going to do the right thing. You're believing in justice in something that's not even a court. You're in the midst of a private membership organization that's created to. This is what this organization is for: to remove kids and rehome kids for profit. That's what it. That's what it's for. Not, it's is not, it, not only that, David, but the fact that you mentioned the fact that everybody going through all these programs and that. Yes. Do this. Do that. Do that. Do that. Which is, which is no expectation of getting your kids back. There you go. Play. But that's part of the that's part of the, uh, the the time that starts. Yeah, you're talking to, you're talking six months or whatever for mm -hmm. them to take and actually give your children away. Yeah, so you're, they're having you get go through all these programs with mm -hmm. expectations of getting and the time and time or whatever. That's what it's and about. Then at the end of it or whatever, you might in reality you may have another month. There you go. Because you already burned up five months or four months to just doing what they asked you to do. There you go. So they stretch it out well, on purpose. That's the purpose of it. If you look at Title Four E. Title IV-E is created to go after people who don't have money. And the second thing is, I mean, for low-budget families, that's liter literally what it says in the, in the, the law. They, it's for low-income families. So they're not going after rich people. They're just going after ones they can take them. They won't talk back. Okay. Yeah. I'll finish up. So that's the thing. So, you know, let the people know that they're taking your kids anyway. So we're at, the, we're at a point where people who, and this is not government, so I don't want to say that it's government. So... It is not the government of Arizona that's taking our kids. The government of Arizona gets paid by the state of Arizona. These people are separately working in a private capacity. They have um, private contractors uh, agreements 
in order to be able to come together and take his. There's no such thing of adoption in common law. That's something that's completely private and statutory. It's private. So their private business, taking your kids privately, making you think that they're government officials when they're not. So they're, they're government official at like 2 o'clock on Wednesday, but when they're in your case at 3 o'clock, they're, they're private. So thank you, guys. Dr. Canson, I'm, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my history. I've had my three children, three, four, and seven, taken by DCS without a warrant, without probable cause, and uh, without any emergency circumstance. I, um, I'm a military combat veteran. I served in Afghanistan for a year, and uh, I was honorably discharged in 2010. Um, I've been studying law for since 2010 when I got out, because um, I was dealing with small town police corruption, and uh, I eventually came across, um, I went down all the rabbit holes that everyone's talking about here today. The uh, birth certificates, the social security numbers, the robes, the, the Title IV American flag, the gold fringe. And I've come to a conclusion that I wanted to share with everybody and take my negative experience and apply it positively. So if you can, if you can have a base to start, for anyone that's just starting this, for anyone that's afraid to start, I would start right with the Citizens Rule Booklet and the Common Law Handbook. You have to learn the basics. So the, the thing to address with fear is why, why do people fear? Where does fear come from? Unknown. The unknown. So when you go outside and the alley is dark, you're not afraid of the darkness, you're afraid of what's unknown in the dark. What you might trip on, who might be waiting to harm you. So knowledge is power. So I would encourage everybody to study common law. Start at the very basic. If you want to go online and go down rabbit holes and drive yourself nuts with this stuff, go for it. Google everything that you want to Google and drive yourself insane. Go down every rabbit hole, but I've already done it. And other people have already done it. And a lot of these people are bringing really good information to the table. So common law is where it's at. We have to learn the law. So if you don't know your rights, you don't have them. You don't have them. You can't assert them. So I would suggest another another good place to start and get a good foundation. So everybody knows the story about the wise man building his house upon the rock and the foolish man building his house upon the sand. And when the storms of life came, the foolish man's house fell and the wise man's house stood. So if your foundation is faulty, if you don't have the foundation of knowledge and common law, what the maxims of law is, what is due process, what is jurisdiction, what what is hearsay, like basic terms, basic concepts of how the court system is supposed to work, how to get a jury, how to subpoena the government, how to recall a judge, how to contact the, the common law grand jury and do an impeachment on a public servant who is out of control. If you don't understand those basics, you can go into court all day and you can him and han scream and cry to everybody on Facebook, but you're not going to make any headway. You need to get your foundation right. So I would suggest to everybody, study. I, if you guys want one, contact me on Facebook. I have a Fight Corruption AZ group. So one is called the Citizens Rule Booklet, and another one is called the Common Law Hand Booklet. Um, I, I send them out to people as part of a ministry, and I pay for postage, I pay for everything. So if anybody wants them, ask me for it, send me a message on Facebook. But the fight against CPS is a fight against corruption. So we've got to remember to stay peaceful, and we've got to remember to stay civil, even though they're not, because they know how to deal with people when you lose your temper. When you lose your temper, they use it against you. So you got to get smart. you got to get wise. The Bible says to be as smart, as wise as serpents, but as gentle as doves. So if we're not going to take the effort to wake up 15 minutes early every morning, an hour early every morning, to study the law and to learn our foundation and to, and to set a good, solid foundation, what's the point in getting your kids back? I got my kids back, but I don't know how to prevent from them getting taken again because you still don't have your foundation complete. So we got to study the law. And you can't, if you're going to depend on an attorney, these attorneys are there to make money off our kids. They're there to make money just like everybody else is in this world to make money. And they're not going to, if they, if you hire an attorney and you, you give $20,000 to this attorney, guess what? If they dismiss your case, if they file a motion to dismiss and get your case dismissed right off the bat, they, they have to give the rest of that retainer back to you. So it's in their best interest to keep that case going on as long as they possibly can keep it going on. So, yeah, they want to milk that retainer. They want to keep all that money. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about if you're if you're innocent or guilty. What matters is our children. And the only way to fight that and really fight this corruption is to get a foundation of what just the common law is. So if you guys, another good resource to go and uh, build that foundation is Carl Miller with a C. He's got a three series videos on how to study the Constitution. And there's, there's a lot of good information on my group too if anybody wants to go and check it out. So 
just keep up the good fight, stay peaceful, stay civil, and keep building your foundation. That's all I wanted to say. So, all right. What's the name of the group? Fight Corruption AZ. Yep. Okay. My husband and I ignited this uh, demonstration today with the help of Sarah and her mother, Carla. And I've uh, been hearing the stories today, and my heart goes out to each and every one of the hearts that's been ripped out of you. I can identify because in 2000, uh, no, not 2000, 1995, my two children were taken from me. And after two years, they were miraculously returned to me because I stood my ground with the Lord Jesus, because without him, I wouldn't even be here today. I'd be in a padded cell, six feet under, strung out on drugs, or an alcoholic. <laughs> We're all the above. But anyway, before I got to the six feet under, because it is the worst thing that anyone could go through. I wouldn't wish this, like I've said before, on my worst enemy. But. You know, God has his way of restoring. He has his way of recompense. And he is a God of judgment. And I'm here to tell you that God is judging this evil that is happening to his children. This is his top priority. What we're here for, it's his, his top priority. Because, because there's a sign out there. Jesus said, woe to you that have cause these children to stumble and be afflicted, that it's better that a millstone be hung around your neck and cast to the sea. And that's where these people are headed. And prayer changes things. And prayer is just not prayer, it's, inner, it's, it's warfare. You tell them, back off in the name of Jesus. You're going down and you send the children back and you'll, st you'll see them come back to you. And, and like I said, God is a God of restoration. He's a God of reconciliation. And you stand your ground, you will see the triumphant, victorious victory in your lives. And this is CPS crisis uh, across America. It's not talked about enough, the cause and effect. This is the effect. All these stories today of, what, do I have lipstick on? Thank you. Okay. Love my friends. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is the effect of the cause. And if you know your history, people don't know their history. There's a, a dictator in Russia some years ago that was asked by a journalist, why is it that your people don't re react and resist your tyrannical government? You know what his comment was? They do not know their history. There was never a journalist that since then that was able to come in and speak to the dictators <laughs> after that. But anyway, going back to the genesis of CPS, um, Hillary Clinton has a lot to do with it, but how is it that this corruption and evil has taken over America? You can't even recognize America anymore. We're, we're supposed to be the land of the free, home of the brave. And believe me, God is raising up a remnant and an army to bring that back with the paradigm shift. And it's starting here today. And it goes back to money, the love of money. Follow the money, right? Spirit of mammon. And there's a scripture, you can't serve two masters. You will hate one or love the other. Well, what is the... the um, the ministers, what is their title? Shepherd. Aren't they supposed to take care of their flock and the children? Well, I've been through a lot of churches growing up, and when I went through with my own two children being removed and taken and seized, we were thrown to the wolves. Now, Jesus just don't throw his lamb to the wolves unless they're equipped. But the ministers in the 19... 50s LBJ amendment he held the forbidden fruit before the ministers and they took it hook line and sinker and it was that they can get millions of money if they become nonprofit and so in the 60s when Madeline Marie O'Hare came on the scene all the ministers were inundated with the muzzle over their mouth and a ball and chain to the government they didn't realize 
obviously, that they had an amazing position with the government, that they were influenced. My mother told me, which I had signs, wonders, and miracles in my church growing up that I don't see today as an adult. Sweetheart. She's so cute. I love her. the girl. But anyway, um, I saw miracles that we just don't see today. And my mom, when I was, I caught on to this 501c3 nonprofit covenant with hell, is what I call it. She said, yes, our minister went to Madison twice a month to stop unconstitutional law in the House and the Senate. And that all faded away when 1960s came around and prayer was taken out of school. And Madeline Marie O'Hara took God out of the public school. The ministers were inundated with that muzzle. And all hell came in. And that's why we have this today. That there was no more protection of the flocks, no more protection of the lambs, no more protection of the family. Do you go into a courtroom and see ministers packed out? And on behalf of your cases, that's an abomination to God. Mm -hmm. It's all our founding fathers, 52 out of 56, were born again. Uh, well, they were Christians. You know, I don't know if they used the terminology. Born again Christian, but they loved the Lord Jesus. They loved the Father God. And the Constitution and the Declaration was hand grafted by the Spirit of the Living God through their hands. And it was the most powerful constitution that any nation has ever had. And we need to stand up and protect our constitution. My six-year-old granddaughter knows the five freedoms. She goes, Nana, I go, uh, she goes, I said, you know more than most people. She goes, yeah, more than 99. I go, 99%. And she can name off the five freedoms. She said that from, uh, this morning before I came. And I, know, I said, well, you know more than 99% of we the people to know your five freedoms. And we have one today, assembly, petition, uh, freedom of press. And what is freedom of religion and freedom of speech? And if you don't know your freedoms, you're going to lose them. Just like George Washington said, the most urgent thing is to teach our future generations the science of government and how to be guardians of our God-given liberties and freedoms, or we will lose them. And our generation, like right here, they're going to rise up to be guardians and warriors of America and the Republic. We need to reoccupy the Republic because it was meant to be a lighthouse to the whole world. And that has been taken over with, with, with the corruption and the gross darkness of people who want to take over America and desecrate it. So. I'm seeing that I'm here today to, to say that the topic of the cause and effect of CPS's crisis across the nation, it started in the 50s. The 50s was the most wonderful decade of, of America. It was called the American Dream Decade. And that's when you could talk about Jesus in the public place at the gas pump, in the courtroom, you know, in, in the marketplace, in the schoolroom. So when that sh was shut down, that gave Satan and all his cohorts legal access to, to attack our, the most vulnerable, precious treasures that God has, our ch children. What's most precious to God? Children yeah. and their family. And mm -hmm. a family is to represent the kingdom of God, and Satan is got to do a bang-up job in destroying that foundation and, and structure of safety for our children. So I'm just here today to tell you, you're being a part of history. It's going to go down in history. I believe with all my heart, mind, and soul that this is a manifestation of Sarah's prayers, our prayers, you know, Valerie, Victoria, all of us, Octavian, my husband, Ray, and all of you have a bright future. Let's, stay, let's stand together. Let's stay together. And united, we will bring this prevail and the gates of hell will not prevail but we will and the restoration of children and I will take your precious faces of your children put them in my heart and your your precious loving heart for these children and your husband I will hold them up before God every day and you will see the supernatural intervention of God and I say that for all of you and I just thank you, and I just, I am so blessed that you're all here and that Connor at the second before the hour 
he went to video. I know you have a video. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. He's always been there for years. <laughs> Helping me get out of the hopper. He's been God's vessel. I'd be into prison 2.7 years if I showed up in my trial on yeah. December uh, 20th, 2016. That was your crucifixion day. That was my crucifixion day. I had a judge that I didn't know. He was a rogue judge. He was um, the worst that the Judicial Conduct Commission ever dealt with in 10 years. And I told him, I told him, I said, Your Honor, because they wanted me to plea bargain. And they threatened me, there's a lot of dynamics in it, but they, the first lawyer threatened me with 10 years, the second one was 2.7. And I, and I said, your honor, I said, I am not threatened by prison. I know I did the right thing in helping a mother rescue her child from a, a foster mom that was raping him. And we were under the law, ARS statute 1302. Uh, I was instrumental in 2000, 2000 when there was a Senate bill that was blocked in the House and it was blocked for a year and I, my story with taking my two children, my two children, I testified in the House and after my testimony the, the committee of the whole unanimously uh, passed the bill to go into law for Governor Hall then she wrote it into law that a non-custodial parent that has just reasonable belief that their child is imminent danger, not positive, just reasonable belief, that that parent can remove that child from the acting custodial parent without prosecution. So my testimony passed that into law. And so I'm here today for the rest of my life. I'm here to serve God, which is to serve you. And humanity. And that I thank you for being a light to the world today. And we're going to shine, shine, shine bright for the glory of God. Amen. And um, I, I'm so blessed. I, I words can't express it. But I'm, I'm melted at your stories because I've been there. You know, and I see the, the battle that you have with these beautiful children and the ones that you don't have. And and um, he wants us to stand together, God does, and unify and watch him work. Believe his word when he says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, Romans 12. And he's smiling yeah. that we're all gathered. Long story short, the judge isn't a judge anymore, but I told the judge, I said, I'm going to tell you what I, my Lord Jesus Christ told Pontius Pilate. The only power you have over me and this court is what my Heavenly Father gives you. That judge is no longer a judge. And, uh, you know, Senate, uh, there's no longer, uh, Congressman Trent Franks, I told him, I said, we need to do a federal uh, audit. Oh, I told him about the children, that over 80% of them, and it's really 90% that shouldn't be taken. And he, and uh, I said, if you don't do something, God's angry, and you're a Christian, and you confess to be a Christian, and you are most responsible. And he stumbled away, Ash White, after I said, and I said, and if you don't, you know, do your part, because I have a video of him swearing in 1997 that he would lay his life down for Arizona's children and families. And he stumbled, Ash White, he goes, one child's one too many to be taken from a family. You know, just on allegations. And I told him, I said, the judgment of Jesus Christ will visit you if you don't in due season, and he's no longer a congressman. He got caught in a scandal. So, you know, you take that back to home and see how you need to cry out to God and just say, in the name of Jesus, bring my children back and take down everyone that holds them back for me. Just clear the path for And don't go by what you see, feel, or hear. And my children came back on wings of angels against all odds. And God loves it when the odds are against his children because when you get the victory, he gets the glory. Okay, so thank you. Did you thank think you, you were you. damaged? Did you think your children were damaged as a result of it? Oh, they have some issues, but you know what? They're fully productive adult children. They love their mama, and uh, you know, so God brought back. Their, huh? He brought back their innocence. Oh my goodness, my youngest one was violated, and he, God brought back his innocence. He's got just righteousness coming out of his mouth. He's the first to protect a child. <laughs>
and he will not hesitate. If he sees a child being mishandled, he'll be in their face. <laughs> and he's my youngest son. He's 28. I lost him at five, and I got him back at seven, after two years. And we went through some rough times, but you know what? It's all worth it. We're all great. He was, he was going to be here today. I'm sorry he isn't, but yeah. We're all close. Extremely close. So. All right. Well, we love you. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Thank you for going and getting Diana and her beautiful girls and little baby. And uh, I, I just love all of you. You're my family. <laughs> so, um, I don't know where we go from here. Yes, Bob. I think it's really wonderful that as many people showed up as, as how many did. And I am more than happy that more than 10 people showed. Amen. Yeah, I just, you know, yeah. Ray wanted a multitude. I said, there's going to be as many as God wants. It's going to be impactful. So, I mean, a story with one is worth more than 10,000. Without I didn't get a chance to share. I just wanted to see if I could share for a minute. Yes, come on. Oh, okay. My name is Renee, and I was a licensed foster parent. I've been involved for 14 years now. Um, and so I always saw the other side. And all I ever knew was what the CPS worker told me about X, Y, and Z's parents. And I never had that communication. I never knew whether this stuff was true or false. Um, and so my perspective changed a couple years ago. Um, I had already, I, I had four biological children and I fostered and adopted five. And so a couple years ago, um, my sister actually got involved with CPS and her three kids were removed. And she went through hell and back. She got them back. And um, within a few months, they said she could not leave because she moved to California during that time. And she could not leave to come back to Arizona. Um, when she got her kids removed, she had to wait six months. And then they came back within a couple months and took her kids again, took, you know. And she became, well, she was already disabled, so she became homeless. So, long story short, she was killed a year ago on the streets, and I had stepped in immediately the first time the kids were removed and made myself known that I was a licensed foster parent and that I had a sibling already because I have the oldest son who's now 16, and um, I, w I wanted them to come be with me if they didn't get put back with mom. And I already had everything in place, I had training, everything. And after my sister's death, because I had already started the process for the interstate home study, and they uh, dragged it out, they did not give me my referral for six months, they um, denied me because one of the loft bedrooms was set up as a, had my bed out there, and so I had to move it. But in the two weeks that it took me to like rearrange everything and call them back to get it ordered, they said I had been denied. So it took me six months of court going back and forth to California to finally say I wasn't, how could I be denied? This company contacted you, said, yeah, I was not denied. Where are you getting this from? Anyway, back and forth, uh, spent over th probably $30,000, all my kids' education funds. Um, I have showed up to every single hearing. Family is not acknowledged at all. So I know like parents go through hell and back and I never knew what my sister was going through until I started carrying the torch for her. And it's ridiculous. Like as a maternal aunt, I have no say. I can get no records, no minute orders, no reason for removal. Um, I'm treated like a complete outsider. Um, even after my sister's death, like I paid an attorney $7,000 to represent me for one hearing. I gave him 330 pages of evidence. He did not submit any of it. Um, he did not put the boys on the stand. The boys had been saying they wanted to be with me and for a year and a half. As soon as I get my approval, the foster family took him to the beach, said, oh, you get all the stuff that you like at Auntie's house if you go to court tomorrow and say that you want to stay. Okay? I had five witnesses. Bye. Had everybody sign the letter, send it to the court. No, oh no, that's Bye. not happening. That's not happening. Bye. Then the oldest had a suicide attempt. Oh, it's because he wants to. He wants to stay where he's at. Okay. 
Lily? Open it! Okay. And then he's bonded with them, even though we spent our whole lives with them. And they were at my house four or five times a week. I was a wet nurse to the middle child. Uh, he had a third degree burn and I cared for him. I have a sibling, like what else do you need? I have a foster license, 10 years of plus of experience, special needs license. I had bought beds, dressers, clothes. It's been there for a year and a half, almost two years, before I even knew if my sister would get him back or not. So now, I don't have the boys. I don't have my sister, and we have no standing in court, we have no voice, and I think that is wrong. You know, every, I have filed over 15 petitions for family. Every grandparent, aunt, uncle has filed a petition, a motion to intervene with the court, been denied. My dad was placement the first time the boys were removed, denied de facto parent to get standing in court. I was denied de facto parent. My mom was denied de facto parent. We had 30 letters from all family members, um, workers that come in my home all the time, therapists that work with me, all saying, yes, she can handle the kids, because they said, no, you're a single mom, um, you can't do it, you know? And I have adult children that are very helpful. Sorry, baby. And I have um, resources. Like when they say, well, who's your emergency contact if something happens at 2 o'clock in the morning? I had like five neighbors, you know? And every. Yeah, and I'm licensed to take three strangers' children, and they can have special needs, but I can't have my own three nephews. And so they're going to be adopted. This new family is telling them that they are Hispanic which they're not, they're African American and Caucasian, but they're Hispanic, so they want them to be Hispanic. They're teaching them Spanish, they're completely alienating all the grandparents, all of us, the brother. The brother has had the most horrible year. His mom died, and then he spent every three months driving to California to go to court to have his heart crushed. These parents were high-fiving these kids as they're coming out of the courtroom after they found out they could be adopted and my son's laying on the floor crying, you know, and I just, these other, all my other boys have been through so much. It is, it is, and I just, they're going to do a closed adoption. I filed appeals, my, my appeal was filed in February, I still don't even have a date. So I'm waiting to get a date in the second appellant court, but I've heard that they can go ahead and adopt before my my appeal is even heard. So I don't know what other support is out there for non-parents, but um, I think that needs to be restructured. There should not be no next of kin. You know, when uh, my sister died. Why don't you go to federal court and get an injunction to stop the bastards? I don't know how what that means. I will do it. You tell me exactly what I need to do, and I will do it. I'll look up injunction. To federal court and explain to them what's gone on, and you need to get an injunction to stop California from doing it from the Arizona federal court. The Arizona civil court, Maricopa County Superior Court, is overthrown government. You have to get into federal court to get anything done. Well, I mean, my court is actually because it's interstate, it's California, so I'm waiting. It doesn't matter. It's second district of county court and district here. court. You, you live here, your jurisdiction is here. You go to this court over here. But I'm not a party. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be a party. I don't. You're involved. Okay. Is it, is it your sister's children? Yeah. And get her signature on the bottom of the thing notarized. She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. And every time I find a yes. father and bring him forward, they come up with some phony, no. oh, well, he's not the father, even though he's on the birth certificate. We have a DNA test. Then you're the last one standing. I am, but I have no one standing alone. You are standing in the shoes of your sister. That's the position you take on the paperwork. Standing in the shoes of my sister, who is deceased. And you go in this federal court and get an injunction against California from adopting your kids away from you because they won't respond. They're delaying so that the kids are gone before you can ever get anything done. Right. They send me on doing. so many goose chases and 
said, and oh, now that you have it. They know they can get away with it because they, did, they know you don't know what to oh, do. Oh, they knew exactly what they were doing. I had a 30 day plus visit over the summer right after I got approved. And the caseworker down there had called. I, it only took 24 days to get my approval. But she called and intervened several times trying to get it dragged out. And um, then she said, I couldn't have a 30 day visit. I, had, I could only have 25 days because 30 days would look like, as placement. So. Right. Right. Okay. So now you're the only one that's alive and he says that you're you're standing on behalf of your sister. You're the only live being trying to get those children. You have people in courts who are, are judges, that's not a man or a woman. You got lawyers, that's not a man or a woman. You got social workers, none of them are gonna make a claim to that kid if you do. So right. if you say I claim that that little one belongs to me, they're not gonna say well we claim that they belong to us because Nobody's going to stand up as a man or a woman, so you can walk up and then you have standing because you open the court and you move the court to issue an order so that you have a little. Okay. But he, he's 100% right. So okay. You know, and you have to say the words. The words are your name standing in the shoes of my sister who is deceased as of such and such a date. You are the last known family member who has the desire to to uh, get those children back in here. Okay. She has it in writing that baby happened to her before she died, after she died, that she go to my sister. Yeah, I submitted all that to court. That's not the court. See, the, right, the it's the wrong court. Well, and you don't know what you don't know until yeah. you know. Well, you know what I'm saying is, <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to give you clarity so you don't uh, Keep spinning my wheels. So anything that's a private entity that's not a court of law is the wrong place to be for real man and women. Okay. So when you're one of the people and you're trying to make a claim to something, you need to go to a real court and let the real court make the decision on what happens, not an entity that's trying to act on behalf of some, some stakeholders that's trying to make money. So when they're, but whenever I've tried to do anything in California, they say California doesn't have jurisdiction over the children because it's California C DCFS. Well, do I need to do it at the federal court in California? No. No, you do federal court in Arizona. You live in Arizona. Okay. You can also go as Amicus Curie. And I gave them a copy of the letter that I wrote. Okay. I'm a brother. Okay. Okay. So, so as a friend of the court, Amicus Curie, you are the last person standing who wants the children who are family members by blood. Okay. By the okay. Social Security Act, which is their own rules and procedures, which they go off of. Social Security Act is absolutely They have to go by procedures, not you. But by their own procedures, it says that they have to give, to, give the little ones to a blood relative first. So they're already out of order. Right. So they're going against the law already and their own procedures, but if nobody brings it up in a real court, nobody ever knows. So they'll take your arguments and laugh at you to your face yeah. because they know that it's not going to pass that door. Yeah. So that's why they laugh. Because there's, at you. yeah, their sibling even filed stuff in California. Because I was doing everything anybody told me to do, but the people who were giving me the information were the guardian ad litem. Yeah. So <laughs> and I didn't figure out they were on the other side until. So they right. Right. So if you open up the court, you're you're the queen of the court. You're the one who's the real person saying something is wrong. Okay. Now anybody who wants to call you a liar has to come to prove. Now what do they have to have those babies in their hands? Like you know, your biological relatives. Yes. They don't have a blood. So what point do they think that those kids belong to them? Right. They can't do it. So they don't right. have to come here and lie. Right. And they right. Okay. That's good to know. Beautiful. That that helps me. It <laughs> gives me a hope for another day. Like Look, to God, push God, forward one the, more. The Constitution and the law came from based on the Bible. So that's where hope comes from. God. So when you hear the truth and the right things, it makes it better. Like I lost my four little guys named with me right now. I'm not sad crying. I'm not broke down because I have hope. And I prayed to God and asked for help. And God sent me people who helped me. People who helped me. See this lady sitting down over here? 
right down in front of him. This man right here, this man right here, God sent me people who led me in the right way. And that's been my prayer. Him. It's written on my mirror. There you go. So the thing is, just have faith and trust. And, and here's how. When you start seeing the truth, don't be afraid to tell other people and it will explode. Because people are tired. They just don't want to tell you. And so we all been in the same situation. Don't, don't be stricken with fear. Don't be sad. Don't be down. Just know that God got the ability to give you what you need. The wisdom you can pray for, you got to it. Yeah, and so now you, carry it. you thank him and you trust him and you be expecting your desired end. You be expecting for your little ones to come back. Because he's able to do it and he's giving you people who can do it. Mm -hmm. So you trust him. When he gives you what you ask, trust him and keep fighting. All right. Even yeah. with the human rights tribunal court, you still have that familial status. Yeah. That your rights to have been violated according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay. You know, and, and it goes back to the law of nations, too. Right. Well, and like one of them is the 16th Cherokee, so I filed ICWA and nothing ever got recognized. Like, I don't because know what I need to do. Because their system of things wants to make you hit every brick wall so that you're eventually going to throw up your hands and say, I surrender, I quit. Oh, yeah. I think they expect that. Well, so then you yeah. say, oh, hell no. I'm going to go over, I'm going to go around, or I'm going to go through, but I'm going to do this journey, and I'm right. going to win, because the truth is the truth. And the truth is the truth. Right. Well, I appreciate all that. I appreciate you guys giving me information and for you to be here. To God said it. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't limit yourself to just their de facto courts. I would file, file your case with the human rights. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yep. File everywhere you can. Yep. And if, if the court here, the federal court here, says we are going to transfer this to the federal court in California, then that will be okay, too. Okay. But it just costs you more money to go over there. Okay. That's the problem. So that's More why money, you do it here. You mean to drive? <coughs> it's going to cost you money for gasoline, for overnight, and all this other kind of stuff. I go down there every three months for the court hearings now. I, I would go Might as well go in and file paper. Money's money, God's place. File paper, <laughs> file paper, and raise hell. Go to the tribunal. Well, it's really I don't even know. Like David said, you know, you do an outdated <coughs> okay. and here's the website. Awesome. All right. And that's the link you go to. And this is for the Human Rights the yeah. Human Rights Tribunal. Okay. Right. Okay. Oh, relieved. <laughs> Thank you. And I, my heart goes out to everybody that's fighting for the kids because it's real hell. <laughs> the fight will go on. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. That was good. That was. Thank you for sharing that. Madrid, uh, uh, we're all fighting here for the same thing, uh, the injustice going, passing through our families, CPS, family courts taking advantage of innocent parents, just because we obviously don't know, uh, didn't know the rules, how they worked and everything. Uh, it has never been in their uh, child's best interest to, uh, to help a child. It's always been about the money all the money that the incentives ask for program, Title IV-E programs and everything. <laughs> and I thank everybody for coming here, and Carla, Sarah, and everybody for uh, doing these meetings for everybody. And I hope we could all get together more more often so that uh, Ducey, David Garcia, and everybody that's on top of us, on top of uh, DCS and everything, know that uh, there are people willing to, to fight, to fight and uh, there are people that are dedicated for the fight of uh, other innocent people that are at home right now, probably uh, not having the time to fight even though they always say they're fighting and this and that. But the people that are here, that's who we really uh, are about to make a change in all this. And I thank everybody and I know uh, our, our children will come back because we're getting somewhere. We're getting close, we're getting close. Just a matter of time. So God bless everybody and thank you for being here. Thank you, Sergio. Three. When there were three, four, and five. Um, this daycare, child time daycare, has been very instrumental in having my kids removed several times. Um, 
My older kids were visiting. I had joint custody at the time, and they came to visit, and they came. They had brought with them lice because they were staying at a friend's house. Well, my younger kids went to this daycare, and they tried to construe that into dirty, nasty, sneak, stinky kids, which they had to leave the room. But when we showed pictures of them, when I showed pictures of them, they said, oh, well, uh, in court, they said, you can't smell a picture. And you could have changed their clothes that day and this kind of stuff. Yeah. That, that daycare, Kendra, Kendra Melvin, and Melanie Passion, that were the main ones, and they perjured themselves in criminal court against my boyfriend, of all people, and it, it should have fell on my ex. And um, I have recordings that I made when they didn't know I was recording them, of where they're telling a completely different story, and I still have that on flash drive, and I've shown that to Crystal. <sighs> my boyfriend accidentally left a scratch on my daughter, and that's how they got removed again. Um, this is the... Uh, Max Orduno is the ongoing um, case manager who is overseeing it. This is the only picture I can find of him. Poltergeist. Yeah. He's overseeing her. Uh, she took all my kids, adopted them out, took many other kids. Then they said she no longer worked for the department and Tulin, but I found her in East Barry, Maine, East Barry, Maine still practicing. And she's grinning from ear to ear. Um, this one is uh, Kimberly Jones. My daughter, after my boyfriend was made to move out over the scratch, my daughter acted out in daycare. There was kids throwing sand at her face and calling her names and stuff, and she dealt with them. So this is the in-home provider we had through La Frontera, and I confided in her, and she says, well, you should... Uh, have an evaluation for your daughter and reluctantly I agreed and that evaluation was just to set up kidnapping and Kimberly orchestrated that of La Frontera. So I've been through it. Um, at daycare, they're the ones that had this, they made these pictures of my kids right before they were taken. Wanted dead or alive. This is a chance video that we had uh, a chance visit, I mean, that we had, well, basically both. Um, and my 17-year-old was with me at this visit, and we got to see my daughter, the one that was taken for, um, you know, having a problem at, at the kindergarten. They took her away, because she acted out at kindergarten, or at the daycare. So this was a chance visit, and my kids got to see her, and she had, actually had a black eye at the time, and she said it was because of a kid throwing something at her, but who knows, in that foster home, she had several bumps, everything else. This is my youngest daughter, really sad right after she left. She only got to see her for about probably a minute or two. Um, I have that on video. This is my daughter when she was crying at the daycare. This is that same daycare, that child time daycare that is behind a lot of this. So when they saw my, um, my boyfriend come up to me, he's not always the brightest. He came up to me by the daycare for a second to give me some money. They were more than happy to report that. And um, it didn't just happen like that. They had me bring my son in for an um, interview at La Frontera. And then they took him aside and asked if he'd seen his dad. Of course he'd seen his dad. And then they, and she goes, I'm removing them now. And I have it on recording. That's what the reason why. And I have video after video showing how well they were doing so. And my kids over there can tell you so. How long have you been fighting for your kids? I mean, that's a hard subject, but um, forever. I mean, even in 2007, I've had to deal with this for a while. And I fought for my daughter, my oldest, to not have vaccinations. And I actually had the state law changed for Arizona for dependent children not to have um, immunizations. And my judge was uh, Judge Rubin. And I later found out when I was looking through papers and stuff. I don't even know how I stumbled across it, but he had the jury trial right removed, as far as I can tell, for uh, parents in TPR. And that's the same judge, and that was in 2012. So, and they went and gave them all shots. Now they've got, they even have my daughter right here on medication. Um, they shouldn't be talking about that. <laughs> yeah, she's on Rimeron and yeah.
Um, my other one, they were giving my oldest in this picture, they are giving her Celexa, Coamphacine, Risperdone. Uh, Celexa is a black label medication not intended for anyone under 18. And they're poisoning my child in a drug trial. Now they tell my other daughter that she can visit, possibly, with her two youngest siblings, but she can't visit with my one daughter that's supposedly been placed in Florida. She can't even send a letter to Florida. Isn't that a red flag? She's on a drug trial and now she's missing. So I'm not dealing with that so well. That's basically my story. But you're not going to give up though. You've been fighting this for a long time and you're... Yeah, but I don't have resources and stuff. But you have people around you. Yeah. That God's put in your life. That's true. And we're going to stand by your side and we're fighting for not only our kids, for your kids, for your kids, for everybody's kids. That's, that's why God joined us together, so we can fight for everybody. Yeah. So It's extremely stressful. You still have my affidavit though, right? For better or worse. I think mom does. Yeah, I think it wasn't mom the best written, mom. but I tried. You, you, sh you what told, mom told her, you sh need to go into the Human Rights Tribunal because they want to take down the system. I did. I tried to go on there and stuff. I just can't, I don't know. I'm not that savvy, but I'll try. Yeah. So I was asked to sing a few songs um, that I believe embody what our country uh, was founded on and also to remind us that there's still hope for children in America and families um, through faith to be reunited. Um, so yes, please feel free to join if anybody does want wants to, wants to sing. <laughs> oh beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of rain, for purple mountains, majesties above the fluted plain, America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. Because he lives, there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. What can bring justice back again? There's power in the blood, there's power in the blood. What can, can reunite children to their families again? There's power in the blood of Jesus. That's, I love that. I, I didn't know you were going to come on with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we're just going to do um, a blessing in Hebrew and in English just to you know, pray for all the, the families here. May the Lord bless you and keep you, place his hand upon you, and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.